caucus room. Uh, if you haven't taken a moment to read the chart on the back of the wall about the uh, historic significance of this room, you should. Uh, it is amazing what has happened here. And uh, I couldn't do it justice trying to recall. But I do believe John F. Kennedy announced for president here, as did Robert Kennedy. Uh, and this was also the site of the congressional senatorial hearing on the sinking of the Titanic. Uh, and many other things. So please, if you're a student of history, take a moment to read uh, the history of this room. Uh, and speaking of history, this year marks the 100th year that Major League Baseball has been exempt from the Sherman Antitrust Act as a result of the Supreme Court decision in the 1922 case, Federal Baseball Club versus the National League. Uh, over and over again, the court, Supreme Court has said it is up to Congress to decide the role of Major League Baseball when it comes to antitrust exemptions. Uh, I happen to think at this moment in time it is, uh, we should be revisiting this issue. This Major League Baseball lockout uh, started on December the 21st uh, and has resulted in cancellation of the beginning games of the baseball season. Uh, I think this is the appropriate time for us to ask about the uh, status of this industry, baseball industry under the law and the antitrust exemption. We're gonna be preparing a hearing on that subject in the very near future. Uh, my advice to Major League Baseball owners and players, think of the fans, do something for them. For goodness sakes, this, this lockout is uh, an insult to a lot of loyal fans who spend an awful lot of hard-earned dollars uh, following their teams. It's time to play ball. So let's Mr. go to- Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Who's Could I speak to that for 12 seconds? S sure, it's Senator from Utah. I have a bill to do just that. Uh, the chairman raises uh, legitimate concerns. I do think we should revisit it, and I think we should overturn that case. I've got a bill that does that. I'd love to work with you on it. I think this might be bipartisan as baseball is, so let's look forward to that possibility. Uh, so we have nine nominees on the agenda today, all of whom are eligible for a vote. I'm going to focus my opening remarks on one of them, Nina Morrison, in the Eastern District of New York, before turning to Senator Grassley. We'll proceed to a vote on the nominees in the order that they're listed. As we've done in previous markups, I ask members to uh, wait until each nominee is called if they wish to make a comment on any specific nominee. Today we're going to vote on Nina Morrison. At Ms. Morrison's hearing, members of this committee made many claims about her that I think need to be addressed. Ms. Morrison has spent nearly 20 years litigating with the Innocence Project, where she's pursued, I think, an honorable, noble goal of exonerating wrongfully imprisoned individuals, largely through the use of DNA evidence. Approximately 30 of Ms. Morrison's clients in more than 10 different states have been freed from prison or death row. Clearly, she's someone who understands there are catastrophic consequences both for the wrongly accused and for crime survivors when the wrong person is convicted. And so she has voiced strong support for conviction integrity, which re uh, the units review potential wrongful convictions and consulted with prosecutors on how to set up these units. Thanks to Nina Morrison, innocent people have been freed from prison. Crime survivors have received justice and actual perpetrators of violent crime have been identified and taken off the streets. Yet, incredibly, members of this committee suggested that Ms. Morrison is somehow soft on crime and is to blame for, quote, skyrocketing crime rates. Let me emphasize that again. Members of this committee argue that releasing people from prison who did not actually commit any crime is dangerous for society and leads to, as they said, innocent people being killed, close quote. That kind of fear-mongering is unacceptable. It is not somehow antithetical to the rule of law for an attorney to represent criminal defendants. The founders and Supreme Court have been clear on this. There is a Sixth Amendment right to counsel, and this right means that criminal defendants deserve zealous advocacy. The cause of justice is served when there is effective and competent counsel at both tables in the courtroom. During the Trump administration, when this committee considered Trump nominees who represented criminal defendants, my Republican colleagues didn't argue that they were somehow a danger to society. One final note, I requested that we all be very careful about what we post on our 
Twitter pages and other places about nominees and to avoid inflammatory and disrespectful commentary. I made this request because one of our nominees received a threat of physical violence that directly referenced a social media post made by a member of this committee. We live in a dangerous time. These people are offering themselves in public service. Let's at least be respectful of that reality that uh, we should be protective of them in the process. After Ms. Morrison's hearing, a member of this committee posted a tweet linking her work in, to policies that, quote, result in more innocent people being murdered. That is the exact quote from the tweet. This kind of rhetoric is not just false and inflammatory, it's dangerous. And I'll turn to Senator Grassley. Oh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand that we'll be able to voice vote U.S. attorneys. We have six judicial nominees, and uh, I'm going to vote in favor of, uh, of uh, Judge Garnett. Uh, that, uh, she served as a federal prosecutor for more than a decade, uh, prosecuting echo terrorists and drug traffickers. She's also served as a state court judge since 2014. I'm just going to comment on one other person that I'm disappointed with the fact that we didn't get answers. I do hope that nominees from this administration would be more responsible than Judge Cato. I was uh, disappointed she wouldn't answer whether she uh, thought racial discrimination was wrong. She also could not have or could have answered whether a case she dismissed on procedural grounds rather than reaching the merits. In other words, uh, why she did that. I also want to briefly touch on the nomination process for Judge Jackson. I'm hoping that Senator Urban and I can send a request for documents to the uh, Sentencing Commission. This administration and Democratic senators have cited her experience on the Sentencing Commission as a very significant part of her experience, and of course it is a very significant part. That's why it's important that we get documents to see her legal reasoning and views. It's part of a thorough examination of any Supreme Court nominee who has worked in the federal government, and compared to the document requests that we had to make available for Kevin, uh, Kavanaugh's uh, uh, nomination to the Supreme Court, these sentencing documents are peanuts by comparison. But now let me address one point that some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been making about documents. Some have been comparing this nomination to Judge Barrett's nomination, and those are apples and oranges comparison because uh, Justice Barrett never served in the federal government in a policy role. That's why she didn't have any additional documents to request when she was nominated to the Supreme Court. I hope we can reach an agreement and get these documents soon. Finally, I want to briefly follow up on something that was said by one of my Democrat colleagues on this committee in regard to uh, carjacking hearing that we had Tuesday. This person said that last year's American Rescue Plan Act provided $350 billion in state and local funding that the Biden administration ha has made available for use in hiring law enforcement personnel and purchasing law enforcement technology and equipment. This is an enormous exaggeration. In his opening remarks, Dallas Police Chief Eddie Garcia testified that major cities have limited American Rescue Plan funding for law enforcement. And let's make it clear, he was very right. So we go to the database from the National Conference of State Legislatures, the National Association of Counties, and the National League of Cities According to those organizations, only a tiny fraction of the American Rescue Plan 
$350 billion is specifically allocated to the police department. To be exact, that is $616 million to be allocated to police. That's less than one-fifth of 1% 1 of what the American Rescue Plan is spending on state and local governments. And it's, not, and it's a lot less than the almost $900 million that's, uh, uh, that just nine of our biggest cities defunded their police department in 2020. I yield. I want to thank my colleague. I uh, would like to perhaps disagree with him in two or three things before we proceed. Uh, American Rescue Plan, remember that one? Do you remember how many votes came from the other side of the aisle for the American Rescue Plan? None. None. And so all of the money that went to the state and local governments to deal with the problems they faced, COVID-19 or anything related to the downturn in the economy, came from a plan supported by one party and opposed by the other party. And now to argue that we were not generous enough to state and local governments uh, when we voted for it and the other party voted against it, I, th I think is a troubling conclusion. I would also say that for many, including my hometown and other cities, the notion that they were given some financial help in one area freed up funds for other areas. And they'd establish, as we uh, hope they will, the priorities, and I certainly believe law enforcement is one of the highest priorities. So uh, I will concede the fact that there could have been more specific language about helping law enforcement, but the American Rescue Plan helped cities and states and they were able to come up with resources that otherwise it might not have been available for law enforcement. Secondly, I'm gonna to try to make this very brief because it's a complicated issue, but when it comes to the Sentencing Commission and Justice Jackson, uh, Judge ja Jackson, Judge Jackson has been approved by the Senate three different occasions with bipartisan support. She has made complete disclosure meeting and exceeding past nominees in each of these Senate efforts. The most recent was just last year. Judge Jackson's public record includes 578 written opinions she's authored as a judge. She has disclosed over 12,000 pages of detailed records of proceedings from the Sentencing Commission where she served as a member. The Sentencing Commission is not an agency of the legislative branch, nor the executive branch of our government. It is an agency of the judicial branch. It is one of the most transparent agencies in federal government. Though it is bipartisan in its composition, 97% of the commission's decisions when she served on it were unanimous. In fact, you'll find her many times uh, in concert and partnership with Judge Pryor, who is considered to be a well-recognized conservative. Uh, apparently, that uh, uh, did not preclude Ju Judge Jackson from joining him on many of these decisions. We had a bipartisan call yesterday to the Sentencing Commission about this discovery issue. The Sentencing Commission staff confirmed that the vast majority of relevant materials from her tenure on the commission are already in the public domain, including minutes, reports, public comments, amendments, and similar materials. The commission staff made it clear that the vast majority of the minimal non-public material that might exist are documents generated by career staff and provided to all commissioners, not just to her. Finally, commission staff made it clear that a request of sentencing commission documents would raise significant separation of powers concerns as the sentencing commission, as I mentioned, is part of the judicial branch. This is a door that's never been uh, opened before because there's very little, if anything, behind it. This transparent disclosure of 12,000 pages will certainly give us access to any reasoning and any record vote taken by uh, Judge Jackson. So uh, I have to raise a question as to why this is considered to be an integral part of the investigation. Uh, if, unless Senator Grassley wants to respond, I'm gonna- Yeah, I'd like to respond just uh, briefly to two points. Number one, first of all, the Sentencing Commission, wherever it's housed, is still an independent agency. And secondly, uh, the fact about that we've had her before this committee twice before, remember that in every case, wherever they're coming from, uh, Supreme Court justices always have, de we've demanded higher scrutiny by both Republicans and Democrats for justices to the Supreme Court. 
And I'll just give you one example that uh, everybody understands. Uh, Bork got on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals unanimously and then was uh, overwhelmed completely when he came before the Supreme Court. Just one example. And my example might be Justice Kavanaugh, who had several years of his service in the White House, which the other side refused to disclose documentation on. They hired their own attorney who gave them, gave them an advisory opinion that he need not make the disclosure. Enough said. That was the end of the conversation about disclosure of three years that he, two or three years that he served in the White House. So we can go back and forth with examples in history. I think I'd like to return at this point to the, the uh, meeting uh, we have before us and start calling uh, these nominees uh, if there's no objection. First on the agenda day is Judge Kenley Kia Cato, nominated to the Central District of California. She's been found unanimously well qualified. Senators Feinstein and Padilla have strongly recommended her. Is there anyone seeking recognition on her nomination? Someone seeking. Senator Hirono. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to uh, make a comment regarding Judge Cato. Of course, she is highly well qualified, but I am disappointed that the ranking member has uh, uh, decided that he will not be voting for her because uh, she did not respond to a question relating to whether or not racial discrimination is uh, uh, acceptable. And uh, as I recall, it was in the context of a series of questions being asked of her uh, regarding uh, her position, uh, basically uh, trying to corner her, as, as we all know that there is a Supreme Court case now having to do with Yale and Harvard Law School's admission policies with regard to uh, Asians. And so uh, not only did I find that series of questions and, and the attempt to box her in um, uncalled for, in my view, but I would hardly expect her to respond in that context because, as I said, this is a case in controversy before the Supreme Court where the plaintiffs are arguing that there, is, there was racial discrimination. And let us not forget that she comes from a family where both her parents were interned, incarcerated unjustly during World War II. And so, of course, she understands how uh, terrible racial discrimination is. But this was in the, uh, her so-called not responding was in the context of trying to, in my view, boxing her in on a case that is before the Supreme Court, even as we speak. So, yes, I support Judge Cato. I hope my co uh, colleagues will do so, too. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Anyone else seeking recognition on this nomination? So on favorably reporting the nomination of Kinley Kiyakato to be the U.S. District Judge for the Central District of California, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Lady. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. Aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Mr. Kiyakato. Aye. Ms. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Rocco. Aye. by proxy. No. Mr. Corbin. No. Mr. Lee. No. Mr. Cruz. No by proxy. No. Mr. Fast. No by proxy. Mr. Holly. No. Mr. Cotton. No by proxy. Mr. Kennedy. No by proxy. Mr. Tillis. No by proxy. Mrs. Blackburn. No by proxy. Chair Durbin. Aye. The committee has recorded a tie vote on Judge Cotto's nomination to be U.S. District Judge for the Central District of California, pursuant to Section 3, Subsection 1A of the Senate Resolution 27 on the 117th Congress. I'll transmit to the Secretary of the Senate a notice of this tie vote, and under Section 3, Section 1B of that resolution, either the majority or minority leader may then make a motion to discharge the nomination. Uh, today we're also voting on Jennifer Roshan, Nominated to the Southern District of New York, found unanimously well qualified by the American Bar Association. Does anyone seek recognition on her nomination? If not, on favorably reporting the nomination of Jennifer Roshan to be U.S. District Judge for the Southern District of New York, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Lady. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Mr. Coon. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. 
Aye. Mr. Book? Aye. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Asa? Aye. Mr. Grassley? No. Mr. Graham? Aye, by proxy. Mr. Cornyn? No. Mr. Lee? Mr. Cruz? No, by proxy. Mr. Sachs? No, by proxy. No, by proxy. Mr. No, by proxy. Mr. Tillis. No, by proxy. Mrs. Blackburn. No, by proxy. Chair Durbin. Aye. Chair Durbin, the vote 12-8. The nomination will be favorably reported to the floor. Next is Sunshine Sykes, nominated to the Central District of California. Again, found unanimously well qualified by the American Bar Association. Does anyone seek recognition? If not unfavorably reporting her nomination, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Lady. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. White House. Aye. Mr. Coons. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Rumba. Mr. Bill. Aye. Mr. Bill. Aye. Mr. 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 Grassley. No. Mr. Graham. Uh, I bear proxy. Mr. Cornyn. No, by proxy. Mr. Sachs. No, by proxy. Mr. Holly. Mr. Cotter. No, by proxy. Mr. Kennedy. No, by proxy. Mr. Tillis. No, by proxy. Mrs. Blackburn. No, by proxy. Chair Durbin. Aye. Chair Durbin, the voters 12 will be favorably reported to the floor. Next is Judge Sherilyn Peace Garnett to the Central District of California, again found unanimously well qualified by the American Bar Association. Does anyone seek recognition on this nomination? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Aye. Mr. Lady. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. Aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Mr. Coons. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Romano. Mr. Booker. Aye. Mr. Padilla. Aye. Mr. Ossoff. Aye. Mr. Grassley. Aye. Mr. Graham. Aye, by proxy. Mr. Cornyn. Aye. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Cruz. Uh, no, by proxy. Mr. Sachs. No, by proxy. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Cotton. No, by proxy. Mr. Kennedy. Aye, by proxy. Mr. Tillis. Aye, by proxy. Mrs. Blackburn. No, by proxy. Chair Durbin. Aye. The nomination will be favorably reported to the floor. Next is Nina Morrison for the Eastern District of New York, whom I mentioned earlier, found unanimously well qualified by the American Bar Association. Does anyone seek recognition on this nomination? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Lady. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. Aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Mr. Coons. Aye. Mr. Graham. Aye. Proxy. Mr. Cornyn. No. Mr. Lee. No. Mr. Cruz. No, by proxy. Mr. Sachs. No, by proxy. Mr. Holly. No. Mr. Cotton. No, by proxy. Mr. Kennedy. No, by proxy. Mr. Tillis. No, by proxy. Mrs. Blackburn. No, by proxy. Chair Durbin. Aye. Chair Durbin, the Nomination will be favorably reported to the floor. Next is Trina Thompson, nominated to the Northern District of, of California. Again, found unanimously well qualified by the American Bar Association. Does anyone seek recognition on this nomination? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Lady. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. Oh, Ms. Klobuchar. They said we're okay with the voice votes. Mr. Coons. Aye. Mr. By proxy. Mr. No. Mr. Lee. Mr. Cruz. No, by proxy. Mr. No, by proxy. Mr. Holly. No, by proxy. No, by proxy. No, by proxy. No, by proxy. Aye.
The nomination will be favorably reported to the floor. The next nominee is Paul Montero to be Director of Community Relations Service within the Department of Justice. It's my understanding we can voice, voice vote Paul Montero uh, on favorably reporting the nomination of Paul Montero to be Director of Community Relations Service for the Department of Justice. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The majority of members present having voted in the affirmative, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Cruz would like to be recorded as no. Senator Cruz will be so recorded. I'd like to be recorded Senator as well. Senator Hawley as well. Senator Lee as well. <coughs> All right. Last up on the agenda are two U.S. Attorney nominees, and I understand we can vote them uh, on block with a voice vote. They are Trina Higgins to be U.S. Attorney for the District of Utah, Jane Young to be U.S. Attorney for the District of New Hampshire, and I understand Senator Lee would like to say a word about the nominee for Utah. I'm pleased and honored to speak today in support of the nomination of Trina Higgins to be the U.S. Attorney. Trina is a graduate of Weber State University and the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney School of Law. She worked for seven years in the District Attorney's Office in Salt Lake City, and then she joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in Salt Lake City in 2002, uh, at about the same time I joined that office. And she's been at that office ever since then. For the, so for the last 20 years, she's been a federal prosecutor in, in the same office that she'll now be leading. She'll be leading it, by the way, as, as the uh, first female U.S. attorney in that office, and I congratulate her for that. Her accomplishments professionally and academically are only the beginning of the story. Uh, Trina is a remarkable citizen and human being. Um, in addition to always handling her cases with um, a great professionalism and care, doing the research to make sure she gets the law right, she's also someone who understands human beings and, and treats human being, beings with dignity and respect. Uh, she interacts with her colleagues um, or, or fellow attorneys who are aligned with her and opposing counsel, um, always with the utmost standards of civility. She's exactly the kind of lawyer uh, we need more of in this country, and the kind of lawyer that uh, we want serving in a position like that of U.S. Attorney. I wholeheartedly recommend her as, as a lawyer, as a prosecutor, and as her friend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lee. If no one else seeks recognition uh, on re favorably reporting the nominations of Trina Higgins and Jane Young to be U.S. Attorneys, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Majority of members present having voted the affirmative, the ayes have it. The nominations will be favorably reported to the floor. M Mr. The Chairman. Who's seeking recognition? Senator Hawley. Can I be recorded as a no on Young, Ms. Young? Without objection, you'll be so recorded. Uh, just in closing, an issue was raised early. Senator Lee will be recorded as a no on Jane Young as well. Uh, going back to an issue raised earlier in the hearing on funding the police or defunding the police, you can. Uh, I want to ask that the record of June 23rd, 2021, a statement from the White House announcing that state and local governments could choose to use the $350 billion in the American Rescue Plan, voted for by one party and not the other, for the purposes of hiring law enforcement officers paying law enforcement overtime, and purchasing law enforcement technology and equipment. So the White House expressly gave states and local governments this option to choose in funding the police in their jurisdiction. If there's no further business to come before the Mr. committee. Mr. Chairman, I'd also mention you're a member of the Appropriations Committee, and we made that very clear in the Appropriations Committee, too. No further business to come before the committee. Judiciary Committee stands adjourned. Welcome, Senator Tillis. Ha, 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 ha.